Francis Bacon maintained, astonishment is the seed from which knowledge grows. Indeed, science has always used art, drawing creativity and means from it, in order to popularise a knowledge often difficult to create, in a simple as much as enchanting and spectacular way. Art and science have combined over time in a strategic alliance in order to produce teaching aids which actually represent very refined works of art, as their main purpose is to be as truthful as possible and to represent an accurate mirror of a scientific reality indispensable to knowledge. Even in the absence of a model, the uniqueness of nature has always contributed to teaching with its natural examples. These examples have formed great naturalist collections over time. Nevertheless, the expressive means used to popularise science have always tended to be spectacular. Even today we continue to adopt a creative, artistic and often imaginative form of communication, being aware of man's need to be conquered by beauty and astonishment to become curious and stimulated to analyse and answer the questions of science. In the 1500s, chemists and physicians collected natural curios and artefacts taken during their travels in exotic countries, these objects often giving their houses the look of a museum. Similarly, in the Wunderkammer of the 1600s, it was customary to place scientific collections and rarities in splendid fashion although not always consciously. During the 1800s, naturalists also accumulated numerous finds and research objects in a quasi-maniacal way, exhibiting them on shelves of their institutes in a precise row. Nowadays, the science centres around the world are using astonishing communication means and futuristic and expensive exhibits to attract visitors into the complex meandering of the world of science. The so-called infancy of science lasted until the 1700s. During this period, the process of knowledge was very much characterised by the idea of astonishment and therefore was associated with sometimes monstrous, diverse and rare objects. From the mid-1500s, the collection of marbles was both of nature and art and was largely acquired by scientists and princes, of whom were amateur scientists for the purpose of research. This collection represented a bizarre store of monsters and anomalies that were appreciated as much as the new plants coming from the Americas, as at the time, novelty was the protagonist of the astonishment process. Naturalia and artificialia together mimic the magnificence of the world. With modern science and the enormous increase in knowledge, academic scientific didactics acquired a determinant role. The Giardino dei Semplici of the hospital the Garden of Medicinal Plants passed the baton on to the University Botanical Garden as dissection, once performed occasionally by the dissector, then became acknowledged as a compulsory teaching method for professors of anatomy. As a consequence of this new scientific method, cabinets, or anatomiae, and university laboratories were progressively enriched by various scientific tables, preparations, and evidence. This was the birth of university museums whereupon the greater the collection, the greater the prestige.
Therefore, it was not new to mankind to use beauty as a means for education and for spreading science. Indeed, artists have always been present within laboratories, scientific cabinets and classrooms with their creativity and the various expressive skills at their disposal. The skillful moulding of clay provided terracotta models for teaching, which has now been replaced by plastic materials. Artistic drawings have always produced tables for professors and students of botany, anatomy and obstetrics, whereas nowadays computed graphics experiments with the possibility of three-dimensional virtual reality. Wax, soft, easy to colour and malleable, gave birth to a real form of art, wax modelling. This new art form created models especially for teaching anatomy, dermatology, ophthalmology, pathological anatomy and obstetrics for sciences which required wax flesh teaching aids. This enabled scientists to accurately reproduce the different parts of human and animal anatomy as well as that of plants. There emerged a search for an aesthetic perfection which originated from the close relationship between science and the figurative arts, creating a fusion between the artistic and the scientific. Real artists and craftsmen have been working within scientific institutes up until recent times. They diligently understood the requests of professors and then planned and realised with their skillful hands instruments, devices and machinery for experiments and scientific exercises that the professors intended to carry out. In addition to the popularisation of this scientific novelty, there was the spreading of more and more effective teaching methods for professors, which included direct observation, experiments and exercises. For this purpose, as well as collections and scientific instruments, there were tables created with the greatest of care by the Institute's painter, adhering to the academic year's syllabus as artistic drawings became indispensable aids to the teaching and spread of knowledge. This knowledge was also acquired through experiments and exercises, which were fundamental elements to supplement professors' lectures, allowing the discussion, debate, explanation and communication of science.
temples of the cosmos, temples of the body, as well as temples of nature have been revealed and explained through artistic displays upon which all the great scientists from different disciplines have relied. From Vesalio to Copernicus, from Leonardo da Vinci to Ulysses L. Durandi, and from Mascagni to Chibo. This artistic scientific language may have been adopted over time not only for its expressive efficacy, but more as a form of universal communication. As a matter of fact, Hunter maintained that within the imitative arts, representation is a substitute for reality. Illustrations, biological preparations, models and collections directly convey knowledge without the need of mediation and explanation rather simply using an accurate visual representation of the forms, which could be considered a universal intermediary of the eye, overcoming the babble of languages and lexicons. This is why the representation technique has been used without distinction by natural and medical science. It represents a language which also guarantees an absolute faithfulness to detail, be it man, animal or plant. In fact, it was necessary for the didactic object to be in the flesh to give the sense of tactile perception, in addition to the representation of the visual reality. This was why many scientists required artists to draw not only through memory or according to their imagination, but rather through the immediate live observation of the subject in order to achieve absolute faithfulness to detail. In some cases, scientists even demanded that artists made a direct observation of the subject under microscope. What was exceptional with this combination of art and science was also the ease in which knowledge was spread with regard to scientific discovery. Continually growing new collections, innovative didactic models and scientific instruments were of great help to communicate new and important discoveries. Nowadays, in the global communication era, it is difficult to believe how scientific novelties in the past were able to spread in a relatively efficient and rapid way. During the 1700s, for example, an obstetric collection was necessary to easily illustrate the developmental phases of a pregnant uterus, the various positions of the fetus within the uterus, the ways in which the fetus presents during childbirth, possible anomalies and faulty positions, and the use of obstetric instruments such as forceps. Collections of seeds, fossils, wood, meteorites, ancient pottery and minerals have been accumulated by universities as a byproduct of research and more importantly as an essential compendium for science. Today this represents an important historical and scientific heritage which is now under conservation within Italian universities. As there was no way to preserve any biological material at the time, students relied upon precise depictions. 
These depictions took the form of terracotta, clay or plaster models, and fossil and mineral collections. These collections also consisted of ancient, rare and exotic plants which have been cultivated within temperature controlled greenhouses or are grown within the elegant confines of a botanical garden. All these collections form an extensive and varied historical and scientific heritage that today is at the heart of university museums.